let's face it, it's been months now that the stock market has appeared to be absolutely unstoppable. But is it really unstoppable? And does it ever have to make fundamental sense again in relationship to the economy? Or have the rules permanently changed? You guessed it, it's that time again. Time to tune out the hype and focus on the facts. Facts that matter to you, the income generation. Let's get started. Get ready to separate reality from myth. Joining me right now is Sound Income Strategies founder and CEO, David Scranton. They've created a new type of inflation. And although markets have always been an emotional place, they seem to be even more of an emotional place these days. Jeffrey Small, Market Watcher, is with me. Stock market dynamic is getting ready to significantly change. So let's bring in our co-host, Jeff Small, president of Arbor Financial Services and also the brand ambassador for the Retirement Income Store. So I'm sure that you don't need me to tell you that it's been a crazy few months for the stock market. In fact, stock prices actually hit new record highs the last day of 2020 and have set even newer highs since then. Uh, the S&P 500 index finished the year up more than 16%, and the NASDAQ, primarily because of technology stocks, grew by nearly 44% last year. And remember, this is the same year in which our economy saw record shrinkage and record high unemployment and actually needed the largest Federal Reserve relief package in history just to survive. Now, granted, things have improved since the start of the pandemic thanks largely to that federal aid and other stimulus measures. However, was that improvement really enough to warrant the massive rebound that we've seen so far in the stock market and continue to see in the stock market? I've been pointing out for years that stock values are, are seemingly becoming more and more detached from economic reality, it, primarily because of the Fed's overuse of artificial stimulus that we've seen since 2008. But has it become so detached that reality no longer matters? And if it, can Wall Street just keep on running while Main Street only crawls? And most importantly, what does this mean for you as an everyday investor, especially if you're part of the income generation? These are issues that we're gonna be addressing today and many more. And joining me will be my good friend and co-host, Jeff Small, and also market specialist and options trader, John Nigerian. And later in the show, we'll talk to Delaware-based financial advisor, Eddie Gabor. But first, let's talk for a minute about how and why Wall Street started 2021 the same way that it ended 2020. And how is that? With a bang. Only a week after hitting new highs to close 2020, the stock market set new records again, with the Dow closing actually over 31,000 for the first time ever. And ironically now, the driving force behind this rally was mainly the final confirmation of Joe Biden's presidency and the surprise news that the Democrats would also take control of the Senate. And this occurred when Democrats won both Senate seats in the Georgia runoff election on January 5th. So I say it's ironic because historically speaking, Wall Street prefer prefers a divided government. They like checks and balances. And many believe that a Democratic sweep in Georgia might trigger a market sell-off instead of a rally. And normally that's what would happen. But the market hasn't really behaved normally for over a decade now. Wall Street actually celebrated because Georgia flipping blue greatly improves the odds that Joe Biden's plan for more coronavirus relief will be approved. And the simple fact is this. Stocks ended 2020 on this incredibly high note primarily because of a $900 billion relief bill that was finally approved by Congress just a few days after Christmas. This was the long-awaited follow-up to the $2.2 trillion CARES Act that they approved back in March. And many economists see it as crucial to keep in the recovery moving forward. So Joe Biden's confirmation and these Georgia Senate runoff results mean more relief and more stimulus is probably on the way. And for Today's Wall Street, it's all about stimulus. So, in fact, to such a great degree that big investors are able to basically ignore a lot of the, should we say, scarier factors driving the need for economic stimulus and to stay focused on the hope side instead of the fear side. 
And there are plenty of scary factors out there right now. Right? The coronavirus pandemic is still raging. Right? Uh, COVID-19 cases and death numbers are worse than they've ever been. While we do have two promising vaccines, the efforts to get them in people's arms is moving a lot slower than we had hoped. Joe Biden says he has no plans to order another nationwide lockdown to combat the spread of the virus. But of course, we all know that could change if the case numbers continue to outpace the rollout of the vaccine. So can the markets continue to ignore these factors if they get worse? And that's where I want to bring in my good friend and co-host, Jeff Small, president of Arbor Financial Services, a retirement income store in Melbourne, Florida. Jeff is also author of the Amazon best-selling book, Turning Financial Planning Right Side Up. But uh, most importantly, Jeff, I am jealous I saw all those Facebook posts from last weekend, those sailfish you caught in the cold weather. That was awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. We also want to bring in another very good friend of the income generation, John Nigerian, co-founder of MarketRebellion.com. John is an options trader, and he's also co-author of the book, Follow the Smart Money. John, thanks so much for being back with us. Jeffrey, David, thank you very much. Great to be with you guys. Yeah, so gosh, we were talking just a little bit over a month ago, and you know, you're, you said, okay, I do believe we're going to end 2021 in the markets higher than we came in, and you also said we'll probably have a small correction of sorts in the first half of the year at some point, but I know that was all based upon our assumption that the Georgia Senate runoff race was going to stay red, and of course, that didn't change, and now we got this thing, this dreaded blue wave, and Wall Street doesn't seem to care. But does it change any of your projections or predictions for 2021 in the markets? Um, it does. It changes the sectors, David, that I really am focused on right now. Um, uh, so energy, I think, was due to outperform just because it had been shellacked. And I mean, you know, the old fossil fuel energy and people might scratch their head and say, why? Um, just because demand is coming back. And that's the biggest reason, it's supply and demand. They cut back on supply dramatically globally. Uh, and now demand is starting to come back with the vaccination rollout, it'll be bigger. But I think what I would not have picked as big, and now I am pretty big in, are the alternative energies. Um, solar, wind, um, fuel cell, plug. I mean, there are so many stocks uh, Jeff and Dave, that uh, I, I think we'll get a lot more play because of a slight lean to the uh, blue side in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not an overwhelming one. And for that reason, I think there'll be good spending, uh, but I don't think it'll be as out of control as it would have been if it was a true blue wave that they predicted November 3rd. Well, you know, John, I see the market right now as focusing only on what can go right it's not focusing on what could go wrong over the next three or four months. And so what are some of the things that could derail or stifle this boundless optimism that we're experiencing? Um, biggest one is, uh, you know, lack of uptake for the virus, for the vaccines. That's the single biggest. The next after that would be, I guess, a, a significant pickup in either inflation or bonds um, as far as the yield, and that's already starting to happen. The bonds are already starting to move. So your point's well taken, Jeff. We could easily see um, the bonds, you know, it's always the rate of change. So whether we want to refer to that with the Greek term gamma or convexity or anything else, um, when, when you start seeing an acceleration um, and it's going beyond what would be otherwise normal. I think that's something that we have to be concerned about. It's not out of control at all yet, but that is the most likely culprit, at least so far, are people don't take enough of the vaccine and the Fed gets nervous as these rates and inflation start making a comeback. Well, I'd like to add to that, John. I see that maybe the tapering of the QE programs, the quantitative easing by the Fed programs coming offline a little bit, and then the end of the stimulus as the global economy starts to unfold from this virus and starts to vaccinate. So those things are kind of working against each other, but I think we've got to be vigilant, don't you think? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, as you said accurately, people are really focused on all the good that can happen, and we're all rooting for that, of course. Uh, as Americans and globally, too. We want to get people vaccinated. We want the world going back to normal. But uh, if we start seeing demand pick up dramatically 
and uh, the 10 year bond versus uh, the two year, that spread is at the widest it's been since 2017. And that steepness of the yield curve is implying, uh, you know, that we're, we could see that big jump uh, in interest rates, not to 2%, but if we get to one and a half quickly rather than slowly, that's a problem. That's a big, sure, sure, a strong momentum in the wrong direction. So uh, when you come back, we want to talk about some other sectors, maybe some sectors that might be a little more problematic under the Biden presidency. So John, Jeff, don't go away. We'll continue our discussions right after the break. We'll be right back right here on the Income Generation. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jeff Small, as well as our good friend, good friend of the Income Generation, John Nigerian. Thanks for sticking around, gentlemen. Thank you, David. So, so John, I know one of the things that I think about, too, is some of these, uh, these, these changes that are happening right now in the actual virus, and if a change uh, if we get to a point where, uh, you know, maybe the vaccines are no longer effective, some of the treatments are no longer effective, you know, that's kind of a, a big picture thing we, we have to worry about. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. I, 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 let's assume that doesn't happen. Where do you think under a Biden presidency, we will see some weak sectors? Uh, financials are one thing that I worry about because of regulation a little bit, although financials have such momentum now, it's hard to think that that'll change in the next year or two. What are your thoughts? Well, um, I, I still think big tech, uh, not for uh, some of the reasons other folks are saying, but I think big tech uh, is problematic for any president, new or uh, sitting. And I think that'll be addressed a little. In other words, I think some of the monopoly power these guys have uh, eventually is going to have to be addressed. But in the short term, uh, I, I don't see him leaning against the president, leaning against a lot of uh, the, the market participants in a serious way. I mean, I think overall that the money that's about to flow into the system from the third stimulus, because mm -hmm. we just passed the second one a couple weeks ago, uh, from this third stimulus that's likely to come early in President Biden's uh, administration, mm -hmm. I think that is more than enough to uh, uh, counteract any stocks that are having a little bit of an experience uh, worrying about what sort of uh, additional regulations might come down, whether that's uh, banking or whether it's big tech. I think both survive just fine. How about health care? Do you think that uh, that Biden won't be able, because we're, we're, we're kind of close to 50-50, that maybe he won't be able to lean that far left and, and maybe healthcare stocks will, will be okay, or do you think otherwise? Well, um, when you look at uh, Blue Cross and a bunch of the big healthcare players, United Health, one of the best things in the world for them is, of course, uh, what was endorsed by the Supreme Court and uh, uh, Justice Roberts with that ruling about the Obamacare and ACA. I mean, those guys have absolutely profited in a huge way from forcing Americans to buy insurance. And I think mm -hmm. that just continues, David, um, mm -hmm. perhaps with a little more emphasis uh, because it has not been struck down and four years of Donald Trump weren't able to remove it. So I think in all likelihood, a lot of those healthcare stocks will do much better. In fact, some of them where they had procedures that were put off because of COVID, this is not related to the pre incoming president, but a lot of those procedures, whether it's, you know, Stryker or any of the implant device makers right. and things like that, I think a lot of those surgeries get done and a lot of demand increases again for those uh, medical device makers. I heard a stock tip in there, John. Did you say Stryker? I did, sir. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to write that down real quick here. Dave, call our traders. Anyway, um, 
So something's been bugging me lately, John, and it really revolves around Bitcoin. Um, I guess now the theme with Bitcoin is if Bitcoin goes up, the market goes up, I guess, because that's bringing in buyers to both and people want to diversify. What's your take? Um, I think it's a combination of, uh, you know, supply and demand moves markets, guys. And uh, the supply of new Bitcoins just got cut in half May of last year. They call that a halving. And that is, of course, for those miners, the people that approve all the transactions that go on, they're called nodes all around uh, the uh, blockchain. Um, their rewards for winning those uh, computerized games, if you will, the authorization of that uh, spending, um, that reward is much smaller now than it was pre-May of 2020. So that means demand remaining the same would cause prices to rise because you've got less supply. You couple that with more uh, folks with an uh, opportunity to invest in Bitcoin because PayPal endorses it uh, with Venmo and because Square endorses it with uh, their cash app. That pushed it to almost 200 and some odd million accounts have access to Bitcoin that some of them perhaps had it before, but now everybody with a little extra in their stimulus check could say, you know what, I'm gonna buy 200 bucks. I'm gonna buy 500 bucks. I don't imagine that everybody just says, I'm gonna buy a $34,000 Bitcoin. They're gonna buy this much of a $34,000 Bitcoin. And I think Jeff, that helps lift um, that uh, asset class. That's amazing explanation, John. Thank you for that. But why does the market go up with Bitcoin going up? Why, what's the correlation? I don't think there is any. I think it's just uh, the uh, uh, the demand for Bitcoin um, is going up because of Fed stimulus and because of central bank stimulus around the world. People worrying that their currency is worth less uh, because of that money printing. And I think it's an alternative and a lot of rebels out there like to own alternatives. And this one's one that's really, you know, it was up 300% last year um, and it started off this year with a bang as well. So I wouldn't be surprised to see more people uh, taking little tiny bites at first uh, and then more institutions getting involved and in. those are much bigger bites. It's essentially the new gold, if you will, as far in terms of how investors are looking at it. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time. We only have 30 seconds left, but, but real quick, best advice for our income generation members in 2021, those are who are retired or within 10 years of retirement? Um, any, any pullback in the markets, you don't need to be the first one in. Uh, see if you get a pullback, if you can be a little patient, because I think we will see, and we do every year, see a 10% pullback. Don't be that guy or gal that buys it on a 2% pullback. Let it come to you at a, at a price a little bit lower, and I think you'll be richer for that. Great advice. That's been what I've been telling people, too. So it's good to get verification from my good friend, John Nigerian. John, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate thank you. you, being, thank you we can't wait to have you back. Jeff, stick around. We'll have you back in just a moment. Did you know that the Retirement Income Store publishes its own newsletter? Each month, we share helpful information about the financial markets, research reports, and other resources to help you navigate the complexities of planning and saving for retirement. And we want to help make 2021 the year that you achieve and maintain your financial fitness. We're offering our loyal Income Generation viewers and listeners a complimentary 12-month trial subscription to the newsletter. So don't delay. This offer is only available for a limited period of time. Visit areyoufinanciallyfit.com to claim your free one-year subscription. Let's take a minute now and talk about different things that can actually affect the stock market, whether for better or for worse. Historically, any number of issues can weigh on the stock market, limiting its growth, whether they trigger a correction or worst case scenario, usher in a long-term bear market. Now, typically a flat or downward trending market goes hand in hand with a recession. However, when investors are reacting to fundamentals, the market starts rising again when the economy shows clear signs of coming out of the recession. The market will always recover before the economy because the stock market is forward looking and investors are betting on future growth instead of present growth. However, they're not just looking at economic factors. Social and political issues that could disrupt growth, of course, are considered also. And the potential of a major event like a war 
or a pandemic, such as COVID-19, are also taken into account. And these are all just some of the fundamental issues that influence financial markets under normal conditions. And today, they still do to some extent. However, over the past decade, as artificial stimulus and suppressed interest rates have become the norm, these fundamental factors have progressively had less and less impact. Coming up after the break, we'll talk more about how and why that is and what it might mean for everyday investors going forward, especially if you're a member of the income generation. And later, Jeff will rejoin us and we'll share our own market forecast for 2021. So don't go anywhere. The Income Generation is now available on YouTube. Subscribe to The Income Generation so that you never miss a show. You can watch all your favorite episodes now in one place, as well as catch up with your favorite financial guests. Subscribe now to The Income Generation channel on YouTube. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and today, we're talking about things that affect the markets under normal times versus some of the things that have affected the markets more recently. Uh, when I say that, I mean the last 10 years, of course, really since this unbridled use of stimulus and quantitative easing. So let's just take just a minute and let's talk about the ability of the financial markets to shrug off socioeconomic and political influences and how that ability has actually increased over the last decade. Yes, we did see investors panic and the market dropped by almost 40% when the coronavirus first hit in March. We also saw a sell-off even in the bond market. However, Wall Street began bouncing back soon after the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to near zero, once again, and announced open-ended quantitative easing. And as I said before, before the year ended, all three market indices had surpassed their pre-pandemic peaks and hit new record highs, and those highs have continued so far into 2021. And that's partly due to certain sectors of the market, uh, especially the tech sector, uh, which actually benefited from the pandemic. But as I pointed out on last week's show, it's mainly due to the Fed's actions and the release of record levels of economic aid by Congress. Now, it's important to understand that although these measures taken by the Fed can be defined as artificial, their impacts are in many ways very real to the economy. And that's especially true when it comes to suppressing interest rates. So when you're talking about stocks, for example, mathematically, when interest rates are low, stock values are higher because cash flows in corporations are discounted at a lower discount rate. Think of it this way, think about a fraction, right? If you take the denominator, the bottom part of the fraction and you lower it, the entire fraction is now worth more. And that is a real market influence. Now, there are other ways in which the Fed's artificial measures have real impacts, but the important point is that they also disrupt the market's relationship with reality. And we've discussed some of those current realities already, particularly the continued uncertainty that stems from the pandemic. But obviously there are others too. Although unemployment numbers have steadily improved since last May, that improvement has slowed and job numbers have recently shown signs of moving back in the wrong direction. And let's face it, overall, unemployment is still much higher than it was pre-pandemic. While democratic power and this power shift in Washington does hold the promise of more stimulus in the short term, there are many questions about what it could mean a year or two from now. And many believe that Joe Biden is unlikely to propose any tax hikes until after the pandemic is under control, but still, within his four-year term, raising corporate taxes, raising payroll taxes are part of his economic plan. And what impact that will have on corporate earnings, uh, therefore the stock market, as well as interest rates on people's ability to spend and borrow, consumer confidence, and all these economic factors going forward still remains to be seen. But the point is that big investors clearly aren't thinking about those things right now. However, Will they really have to think about them again? Or is an artificially overvalued stock market simply part of this quote, new normal? That's something we'll be talking about more in just a minute with Jeff Small right after the break. And also our next guest. You're gonna to wanna to hear what our next guest has to say. 
advisor extraordinaire, Eddie Gabor. Stay with us, we'll be right back. I'm David Scranton, founder of the Retirement Income Store. If you're in or near retirement, are you certain you have the right retirement plan in place? Do you want to help ensure your nest egg will last you all throughout retirement? Take our retirement review quiz and find out in five minutes or less if you're doing everything you can to achieve a more successful retirement. Don't waste any more time. Visit MyFreeRetirementReview.com to find out if you have the right retirement strategy in place. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jeff Small, uh, sail fisherman extraordinaire. So, uh, you know, I, I know you like the explanation that John had given us about Bitcoin. Uh, you, you know, me too, because I've traditionally taken a chapter here out of Warren Buffett's book saying, if it's something I don't really understand, I don't want to be involved with it. So that was good. But what else did you hear John say that you thought was uh, a little different or that was surprising, if anything? Well, I think that uh, John obviously has a great pulse on what's happening in the market because he's so involved in the options market. He can see the price fluctuations and the momentum shifting instantly. But I think that he was spot on. I think that his projections are right. The market is very optimistic right now. There's not too much that can go wrong from here other than the virus becoming more mutant. And then we have we, we lose the momentum of the vaccinations occurring. And so those are things that could obviously derail the market or potentially if the Fed decides to taper back on their quantitative easing and their bond purchases, the government doesn't have as much money to spend, Dave. So I think, you know, we're, we're in sync with, with him on this. I think that it was one of his best interviews. Well, with Janet Yellen, uh, head of the Treasury, yes. I mean, you know, she's certainly been the most accommodative when she was Fed chair. So, so I, I, I don't think they'll be cutting back on the quantitative easing and all that in any significant way. You know, pedal should stay to the metal. Um, but how about the 800-pound gorilla in the room is this, this, this corporate tax increase that essentially could reverse the Trump bump when, when President Trump dropped corporate tax rates. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm curious, are we close enough to 50-50 with Senate and with the House that, that maybe he can't get extreme corporate tax increase passed? Is that the thinking? Because if he can then, you know, with the markets being forward looking, assuming that happens, let's say out in, you know, 2022, well, then sometime later in 2021, we should see a market dip. So I guess that's the only thing politically that, that I'm trying to wrestle with. You follow me? I follow you exactly, but I don't think the risks of a 50-50 Senate are as great today as they were during the election time or the recent Senate runoff in Georgia. I think that there's going to be two or three moderate Democrats that are going to pretty much control what happens in the Senate. I don't see corporate tax rates going up without their approval. So the Joe Manchins of the world are basically going to have to vote for that or it's not going to happen. And so we won't see tax increases this year, Dave. I think that might be on the table next year, but it depends on how strong the economic productivity and growth is as we unwind from this mess created from last year's virus. Yeah, and any tax increases on the average Americans would be really make a very small difference. Uh, it might make a bigger difference on higher income payers, but, but I'm not really even concerned about that. It's really the corporate tax rates that to me was one of the biggest boosts, boosts going from 35 to 21. And if that comes back even to 28, that could certainly have a, a negative uh, impact. One thing I love that, that, that John said was when you, you talk about being buying on the dips, he said, be patient. You know? And I find that sometimes when things run up, it's one of our guests recently, uh, last week or the week before, talked about FOMO, fear of missing out like the kids have, right? So you get maybe a 1% or 2% dip and boom, somebody's buying in. And he said, be patient, wait for something closer to 10%. Uh, so I, I thought that was certainly good advice, especially for, for members of the income generation. Well, sure, that's great advice, Dave, but you really don't know when to get in and, and when to get out in the market. What we do know, though, is that the market is at the highest level in valuation since the financial crisis, not just domestically, but globally. So investors need to stay vigilant and make sure because stock prices are so elevated. You know, what, when stock prices get elevated, you know what else gets elevated, Dave? Something called the stupid investor index gets elevated. And that's when investors get hurt the most. The last people, to, the people that get hurt the most are the ones that pile in at the end of the run. Well, and a lot, of, a lot of market watchers have come out and even talked about their concerns about Robinhood and a lot of small investors that have never been in the market. 
and, 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 and I don't mean to use, I, I, I don't, I would disagree with your word stupid. I would say inexperienced, you know, it's one thing when you see headlines, it's another thing when you have your own money in the market and you've taken the personal shellacking. So a lot of those smaller investors are just getting in, haven't taken that personal shellacking yet. And, and, you know, we want to make sure they don't get hurt. The most important thing I think for the income generation is simply that, you know, if you're looking at higher dividend value plays, if you don't time it well, it doesn't matter as much because at the end of the day, you still have that dividend. You still have that bird in the hand, which uh, is what the quote income generation really, really needs. So Jeff, don't go anywhere. We'll talk more after the break and coming up in just a bit, we'll share some tips on preparing your financial strategy for all the uncertainties and all the potential opportunities of 2021. And also, you're going to want to hear what our next guest has to say, famed advisor, Eddie Gabor. We'll be right back on The Income Generation. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and it's great to be with you today. Low interest rates, artificial stimulus, let's face it, they're all here to stay. And some analysts believe because of that, the stock market will maintain its ability to focus on all these positive things and shrug off all the challenges, as you heard Jeff allude to just a few minutes ago. And we're talking about shrugging off challenges that continue to threaten our recovery from, from this recession that was essentially artificially created due to COVID-19 or in response to COVID-19. Some of these folks believe that, at least as far as this year is concerned, an artificially overvalued stock market is gonna to continue to be part of this thing we call the new normal. Uh, of course, along with things like wearing face masks, right? Like having Zoom meetings, uh, online shopping. More new record highs could be in store. And that's what these folks tend to focus on and believe though it seems unlikely that stock values can continue climbing extremely higher without real corporate earnings starting to catch up. And that could conceivably happen by the end of this year. And there are still many genuine reasons for optimism. Vaccines are being delivered. Maybe not at the rate that everybody wants being put in people's arms, but they're being delivered. The political picture, at least now, is clear or for better or for worse. And more economic relief is on the way but there are still plenty of major challenges, any one of which could quickly undercut investor confidence and send markets back in the correction territory. Some analysts believe that could happen as early as the next few months. Uh, you heard John Nigerian talk about it possibly even happening the first half of this year. And while that could be a scary prospect for some, it could also create, as he indicated, a good buying opportunity. If, and this is a big if, you have the right risk tolerance and the right income-based financial strategy. At the end of the day, let's face it, nobody really knows just how stable this artificially inflated market really is. As I've been saying for years, it's basically one big laboratory experiment being conducted by the Federal Reserve, other central banks around the world, and now by Congress. And like any experiment, the end result could be a groundbreaking success or it could be a big disaster. Bottom line, right now, is that it remains important in this early part of the year to know that your particular financial strategy is still aligned with your own risk tolerance level. It's also imperative to set yourself up to help protect your investments from downside risk and also to potentially take advantage of new buying opportunities in the coming year. Now it's time to welcome back my good friend and co-host Jeff Small, as well as our good friend, Eddie Gabor. Eddie's co-owner of Key Advisors Group in Delaware and is Amazon best-selling author of the book, The Common Sense Bull. Eddie Jaja Gabor, thanks for being back on the show with us. Thank you for having me, Dave. Jeff? So, Eddie, it's great to see you back on the show again. Um, tell us what your thoughts are on how the markets reacted to the Senate election and the presidential election. Tell me what you think. So, frankly, we were not we're not surprised by what happened post presidential election. Matter of fact, we were dollar cost averaging into the market the week prior to the election when we had that 8% drop. 
Uh, I think one thing it proved is politics it just gets overhyped by the media and has nothing fundamentally to do with equity markets. I was a little bit more surprised after the Senate runoff in Georgia that the market kind of ignored that. So that was a little bit surprising to me. But the direction of the market post-election has not surprised us. We think we are going to have one of the biggest years in the market in certain asset classes this year, 2021. Eddie, do you think that's possibly just because uh, we're so close to 50-50 that, that the far left won't be able to really uh, get their policies put into place? That's exactly it, Dave. We feel like any policy or taxes that are going to be passed is going to be have to be somewhere in the middle in order to pass. And somewhere in the middle will be welcomed by Wall Street. And so this election has no concerns in regards to the direction of this market for us uh, over the next 12 months. Great. Well, when we come back, we want to ask you about some of the risks you see in the market today, uh, as well as your best advice for our income generation viewers and listeners. So, uh, Eddie, stay with us, please. Jeff, and you stay with us, too. We have a lot more coming up right here in just a moment from our good friend, Eddie Jaja Gabor. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. When it came time for my mom to retire, one simple mistake forced her to work years longer than she should have. And that's why I started the Retirement Income Store, to help hardworking Americans 55 and over plan for the retirement they deserve. I couldn't help my mom, but maybe I can help you. If you're 55 or older, please claim our free Retirement Income Kit, chock full of information you need to know to get steady income during your retirement. Call 866-314-7227 online at theretirementincomestore.com. The Income Generation is now available on YouTube. Subscribe to The Income Generation so that you never miss a show. You can watch all your favorite episodes now in one place, as well as catch up with your favorite financial guests. Subscribe now to the Income Generation channel on YouTube. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. And I have a lot of fun today because uh, I feel like this is one of our, uh, uh, our semi-annual uh, market study groups because I'm here with my good friend Jeff Small and I'm also here with our good friend who's with us twice a year in these study groups, Eddie Gabor. Eddie is Amazon best-selling author and he's also the co-owner of Key Advisors Group in Delaware. So Eddie, because I, I'm, I, I haven't gotten to meet with you really since November to hear your words of wisdom on all this stuff, uh, tell us what do you think, where do you see the biggest risks being in 21 when it comes to the market and, and whether it's things that could trigger it, the whole market uh, in terms of a downturn or, or, or whether it's even some sectors you think that, that might have more risk. You know, from an overall risk perspective, we do think that anything that's not interest rate sensitive uh, is gonna probably have a pretty big year because of the amount of liquidity that's been pumped into the system. Um, and when you see the VIX breaking down the where it is, we think the VIX will be under 20 this year. So overall, the risk assets, we think, are going to have a big year. Uh, the things that are going to surprise people could be potentially things like REITs, utilities, things that are sensitive to interest rates rising because the 10-year could be, won't surprise me to have it sit, hit at 1.5 to 1.7 this year. I think the biggest risk is people not de-risking as this bubble is forming, okay? As bullish as I am, I recognize that we are forming a bubble in asset prices. And if you're on the other side of the trade, when that bubble bursts, you're in trouble. So that's what that's why you wrote the book, Common Sense Bull, right? That's right. So, Eddie, now that we've identified some of the threats in the market and some things that can go wrong this year for the retirement income generation, for our viewers and our listenership, people should not be focused on exclusively on growth. They should also have a combination of income investing. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I agree completely, Jeff. One of my biggest worries is and we tell clients this all the time. It doesn't matter how bullish I am on the markets. That's my opinion on the market. Whether you're overly bullish or not should not dictate how your allocation is built because someone that is retired should have a balance of fixed income and equities. And again, that's my worry is some people may not focus on their risk management strategy and go overweight risk 
and get whipsawed and get creamed. So as a retiree, it doesn't matter what a talking head says, you need to tailor your portfolio based on your goals. And we do have a lot of fixed income as part of our clients' portfolios, even when we are as bullish as we are. So I agree 100% with you. Yeah, and Eddie, you heard your John and Jerry in a few minutes ago talk about how you know, uh, this should be a year where you buy on the dips. If you get a reasonable dip, like 10% or so, and I think that's especially true if you're, in spite of the interest sensitivity factor, which you, which you mentioned, I think that's especially true if you're trying to buy dips in the stock market uh, with higher dividend yielding stocks, but also in the bond market, because I, I don't know, I, I have to think with Janet Yellen uh, being the head of the treasury, one of the most accommodative Fed presidents ever with the Biden presidency, I've got to think that maybe what we've seen now, this spike in interest rates is really just even a, a buying opportunity in the fixed income market. But you seem to think that interest rates will continue running up for a bit throughout the year. I do, just for this year. And I think once we do, we could see a top there because, again, the momentum is moving forward. And as you know, that momentum a lot of times will stretch out longer than we initially anticipate. Uh, and then at that point in time, I think we could have an even better buying opportunity in the bond market. But just like stocks, dollar cost average in because you're never going to hit the top of the range. Yeah. Okay, so I get it. So our income generation members, you know, get, get their income taken care of first, then use growth once your basic income needs are taken care of. Uh, any final thoughts for our friends and family that are part of the income generation? Look, again, I think the final thought should really be is focus on what is best for you and your family versus where the momentum is going. You know, I don't think you have to add Bitcoin in your portfolio because that seems to be the hot topic. Focus on risk and everything else will take care of yourself. Risk management and everything else will take care of itself. Hallelujah. I love it again. And that's why you wrote the book, The Common Sense Bull. You literally wrote the book. That's not just a cliche. Eddie, thanks so much uh, for being back on the show. And uh, say, say hi to Zaja for me, okay? Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. You stay with us. We're not done yet. We have a lot more coming up on the income generation. We'll be right back. I'm David Scranton. During my career, I found that most baby boomers have done a great job growing their retirement savings, yet many don't know how to convert their savings into steady income. And that is why I built the Retirement Income Store, to help hardworking Americans preserve their assets and establish steady streams of income. If you're 55 or older, our free retirement income kit is for you. It's chock full of information you need to know to get steady income during your retirement. Call 866-710-1749 online at theretirementincomestore.com. For behind the scenes photos, retirement planning tips, and upcoming giveaways, follow the Income Generation Show on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch video clips, guest interviews, and to catch up on past episodes. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. And let's take a minute just to recap today's show. In some ways, today's financial markets are like one huge laboratory experiment, an attempt to see if this fundamental relationship between market performance and the economy can be permanently changed. The Federal Reserve and, frankly, all the central banks launched this experiment in response to the global financial crisis that we had starting back in 2008. So it's been going on now for over a decade. However, the next couple of years could prove to be the ultimate test for this experiment. The final toll that this pandemic and the recession created from this pandemic takes on uh, may reveal whether or not the experiment has been a resounding success or a complete disaster. And that's why it's so important to understand all the different elements at play in this experiment and how they could impact you. Since November, we've had a stock market that's hit numerous new record highs and barely flinched in the face of skyrocketing COVID-19 infections, vaccine distribution problems, and a lot of social and political unrest. Now, in the past, these issues might have weighed much more heavily on the markets than they seem to be doing today. But the questions become, will investors continue shrugging them off if they get worse? Will they be able to continue staying focused on this hope of more stimulus from a Biden presidency, even if he orders another nationwide shutdown to combat the pandemic? The truth is, no one knows. 
However, here's the bottom line. There's probably a lot more uncertainty in the current economic picture than Wall Street is choosing to recognize. Could that change? Naturally, it could change quickly. Some analysts believe another market correction is even likely before the end of the first quarter. It will likely uh, not be one as rapid or as steep as we saw in March, or at least we certainly hope not, but significant enough for everyday investors to prepare for. And that means meeting with the right financial advisor to make sure that your financial strategy is geared toward greater protection and retirement income aligned with your personal risk tolerance. Growth is really a distant third or fourth goal, or should be if you're part of the income generation. But also setting yourself up to take advantage of potential new buying opportunities in the years ahead. So I wanna take this time now to thank our guests, John Nigerian, Eddie Gabor, as well as my good friend and co-host Jeff Small for joining me today on the Income Generation. But most importantly, of course, I wanna thank you, our new and returning viewers and listeners. Remember, if you're close to or in retirement and you're concerned about your money, it's essential you stay informed and up to date. And as you know, right here is where you can do it on the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and we'll see you next week.